I'm Martha Minow. I'm the dean here at Harvard Law School. And frankly, the most exciting and wonderful time I ever have is a day like today, because the highest recognition that the Harvard Law School can give to any member of our faculty is a chair. And we today have the opportunity to uh, recognize the chair that Ken Mack has been given. And there is no such thing as a free lunch, and that's why he's going to give a lecture. Um, so he will uh, be speaking uh, soon, but not, uh, not until I get a chance to say something. Uh, in honor of his appointment as the inaugural Lawrence Beale Professor of Law. I am thrilled to welcome special guests, most importantly, Lisa Jones. Uh, <laughs> Lisa is a television producer who has worked for WGBH, Frontline, ABC News. Why is she here? Um, because, uh, frankly, I don't think Ken would be here without Lisa. And Lisa is uh, wise and a supporter and uh, just a, a cheerleader, as well as the mother of Ken's and Lisa's most beautiful children, Sophia and Nicholas. Um, remarkable children, and I'm sorry they're not here today, but we will be honoring them, uh, I'm sure, afterwards. So let me tell you a little bit before I talk about Ken's many accomplishments about the chair uh, that uh, Ken has been awarded as the inaugural holder. Lawrence Beale was a member of the class of Harvard Law School 1936. He was a solo practitioner of corporate law and communications law. He worked for many years in Pennsylvania, remember that, Pennsylvania, until he passed away in 1989. Mr. Beale loved Harvard Law School. He wrote in his 50th year reunion report, and I quote, my Harvard Law School experience was most rewarding. Every breath I drew thereafter was fulfilling and exciting. I am ready to do it all over again if you would have me. His siblings, Dan Beale of Fort Lauderdale and Harry Beale of New York City and Rita Kane of Bethesda, Maryland, created a fund in his memory. And the family members asked that there be a chair for a faculty member to be filled in perpetuity by persons of intellectual distinction with a clear preference for legal scholars whose vision and ideals embody the spirit of the United States Supreme Court Justices William J. Brennan, Jr., Thurgood Marshall, and Earl Warren, groundbreaking jurists whose work Mr. Beale most admired. So when we had the opportunity to award this chair, there was no question in my mind who should have this chair. It is extremely fitting that this chair be uh, filled, uh, held by Ken, uh, who, like Mr. Beale, is a Pennsylvania native, who worked at a time for Bell Laboratories, had something to do with communications, uh, and whose impassioned work on legal and constitutional history of American race relations so wonderfully reflects the ideals of the Supreme Court justices whom Mr. Beale held in such high esteem, and who contributed to the successes uh, and the winding road of the 20th century civil rights movement. Ken has contributed tremendously to our modern understanding of this civil rights history and to our understanding of the civil rights movement's countless reverberating effects on American race relations, on politics, on law, on social justice. But initially, Ken pursued quite a different career. He earned a bachelor's of science degree, magna cum laude, in electrical engineering. He began his career, as I alluded to, as an, elect as an electrical engineer at AT&T Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. He decided to return to school and to pursue his interests in law and history. He earned his uh, JD here at uh, Harvard Law School in 1991, where he served as executive editor of the Harvard Law Review and worked with a classmate with a, an unusual name. What was his name again? Uh, uh, the Law Review President uh, and now United States President Barack Obama. And then uh, Ken, uh, well, I should say he also worked with me and wrote a wonderful paper uh, with me. Uh, and I thought, boy, this guy is really, really smart. And so I was thrilled when he went on to pursue a PhD at Princeton University studying history 
Um, and uh, he completed his PhD in 2005. In 2010, Ken also received an honorary doctorate of public service from Harrisburg University of Science and Technology in his hometown of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Ken clerked for one of the heroes of the civil rights movement, uh, Judge Robert Carter of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. And he practiced law in Washington, D.C. in the office of Covington and Burling. He returned to Harvard first as a Reginald e. F. Lewis Fellow, and uh, he then joined our faculty. Uh, it's kind of a meteoric rise. He became co-director of our Legal History Colloquium. He became a faculty fellow of the Edmund J. Safra Foundation Center for Ethics and a co-director of an annual workshop in the Arts and Sciences Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History. And last year, he helped us invigorate the Harvard Law School program in law and history as a program of study and now serves as co-director with Professor Tomiko Brown-Nagan. Through this new program of study, students uh, receive unprecedented opportunities to examine law and its relationship to the larger worlds of social movements, economic change, politics, and government, all while studying law in a period of time or many periods of time different from our own. Ken has also been a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University, a senior visiting scholar at the Center for History and Economics at the University of Cambridge in the other Cambridge, uh, and a recipient of the Alphonse Fletcher Senior Fellowship. Ken is scrupulous, meticulous. Maybe there's that electrical engineering background, but there is never a detail that has been omitted, never a further step that you could raise a question about that Ken hasn't thought about, researched, pursued. And in doing so, the history is extraordinary, but at the same time, I have to just say, I personally learned so much from Ken in his relationship to history. Seeing history as a source and a resource, but not a roadmap to the future. The future could be different. On the heels of returning to Harvard Law School from England this fall, Ken delivered a very prestigious lecture at the United States Supreme Court as part of the Supreme Court's Historical Society's Leon Silverman Lecture Series. And the theme of this year's series was litigants in landmark Supreme Court cases of the 20th century. Ken was introduced there by our former dean, Elena Kagan, and gave a talk uh, that will be related to his work here today. Uh, and I know, because uh, I heard it directly, that Justice Kagan was incredibly proud to be able to introduce Ken on that occasion. I'm not done. I'm sorry. I have more to say. Uh, Ken has a magisterial book that he published called Representing the Race, the Creation of the Civil Rights Lawyer. It was uh, published in 2012. It was selected as a top uh, nonfiction book of the year by the Washington Post. It was awarded uh, an honorable mention for the J. Willard Hurst Prize for the Law and Society Association. It was a finalist for the Julia Ward Howe Book Award. More importantly, it is a fabulous book. It is a great read. It explores the dualities and tensions in the identities of early African American lawyers during the segregation periods in this country and how they pursued both their allegiance and identities as lawyers and elites, and at the same time, their membership and commitment to the African American community, a tension that continues for many today and is illuminated so beautifully by this book. Um, the book, uh, among other uh, subject matters, focuses on Justice Thurgood Marshall, on uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, who became dean, ultimately, of the uh, Howard Law School, on influential practitioners like Lauren Miller and Pauli Murray, and I, I just commend it to you if you haven't had the chance to read it. He's also recently co-edited another book, The New Black, What Has Changed and What Has Not with Race in America. And the essays collected in this book explore many tensions and many insights coming from the civil rights era and includes an essay from uh, our Ken's colleague, Lonnie Guineer, uh, and many other very interesting books along with the important commentary uh, offered by the editors. Ken's scholarly work has appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, the Journal of American History, the Law and History Review, and his opinion pieces in a whole other part of his life have appeared in the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, the Boston Globe, the Root, the Los Angeles Times, and the Baltimore Sun. 
In other words, Ken does it all. One of Ken's colleagues, Chris Desan, describes Ken this way, and I quote Chris, who's here today. Ken's insights set apart his history. He recognizes and reveals to us the momentous questions that arise in the minutia of everyday life. By tracing the way that African-American lawyers practiced, he exposes the issues of professionalism and personal identity that they daily encountered. He suggests that their answers were also matters of practice, nuanced performances that represented race in layered and powerful registers. Justice Kagan said in her introduction of Ken at the Supreme Court History Lecture this fall that Ken is one of the premier legal historians of his generation, or indeed, of any generation. He is a brilliant legal historian and also, she said, for me, a great friend. It is, for me, a great personal and professional delight to introduce Kenneth Mack, the Lawrence Beale Professor of Law, a brilliant legal historian, and a great friend. After this evening's lecture, I hope you will stay for a reception in Ken's honor, Ken Mack. Thank you, Martha. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you, Martha, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, thank you for all, all of you for coming. Uh, thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, and I'd have to first sort of thank the institution of Harvard Law School, which has been so important in my own personal and professional life. Uh, starting from way back when I was a law student, um, now about 25 years ago, actually longer than that. Um, and there's so many people to thank, but let me first start by thanking the institution and along the way, thank a few people associated with the institution, but also remembering that, um, you know, I'm going to exclude people, but, you know, I, uh, but I'm just going to try to sort of keep it brief. So uh, first, when I was a law student, um, you know, one of the people who really set me on this path was, of course, uh, Professor Randall Kennedy, who's here today, uh, and who's been an important mentor to me throughout the years. Um, Martha who supervised my third year paper. Charles Ogletree, whose sessions of Saturday school back then really were on Saturday, and you know, whose sessions were really important for me, a young person coming from electrical engineering and who had never imagined himself at a place like Harvard, and, um, and was just part of the ways, his, the sessions were part of the ways in which Harvard expanded my world. And also Morton Horowitz, whose legal history class uh, nearly 24 years ago uh, was one of the things that set me on my, the path that led me to where I am today. I'd like to thank my graduate school advisors, Nell Painter and Dirk Hartog of Princeton University, uh, neither of whom could be here, but both of whom send their, their best wishes. I'd like to thank the dean who hired me, Bob Clark, uh, the dean who got me to tenure, Elena Kagan, and the dean who's been my friend and mentor for almost 25 years, uh, Martha Minow. Um, all of you have been instrumental in my career as I think about taking it to the next level. I'd like to thank the assistant professors who I came in with. We were kind of a cohesive group. It was a you know, it was a contentious time. Being a assistant professor is always a contentious time, but it was a contentious time. And we had a sort of group camaraderie. We, we really supported each other's work. Um, it was a model for how a group of assistant professors should be. Um, and even though we didn't always do the same kind of work, we didn't necessarily always read each other's drafts, we kind of thought of ourselves as, as trying to get through. And I think what the institution has done for me, and I think in all parts of my career, is to offer positive reinforcement that I, I felt was so the institution wanted me to succeed. So in particular, I'd like to thank David Barron, Alan Farrell, Guhan Subramanian, Jonathan Zittrain, Heather Gerken, Sam Bagenstoss, Margo Schlanger, and Ryan Goodman. Because um, I, I remember quite well those days when we were all starting out and trying to find our way and how much support we offered to one another. 
I'd like to thank um, my colleagues collectively. Uh, when I was an assistant professor, I felt as though my colleagues wanted me to succeed, and that was an important part of why it all worked out. And there are so many people to thank that I can't sort of do them all, but I'd like to, in, in part, just note, you know, just kind of one little thing about being an assistant professor here uh, that to me really encapsulated what the whole experience was about. You know, I was, I was teaching property. I, I'd actually never taught anything before. You know, I went to Princeton, and they don't really require you to teach in graduate school. You just do your research. And it was, it was very much a traumatic experience being dropped in the middle of a classroom. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, and what was really great was that the author of my casebook, and people have been teaching it for uh, one person for two years, one person for longer than I had been alive, um, were all there for, um, you know, just sort of, you know, I'd run into them getting coffee, we'd chat a little about property, and we'd go back, I'd go back to doing my thing. So I'd like in particular to thank Frank Michaelman, uh, David Barron and Joe Singer uh, for really us being just a cohesive group that we chatted about property and it, and it made a big difference in my own life. I'd like to thank the students. Um, you know, it's, it's, it remains my favorite class, even though I'm a historian. I love teaching property. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it's been a lot of fun interacting with the students. And as a matter of fact, just sort of three weeks ago, I was I was in Washington and I ran into one of the students in my first property class. And I always kind of sort of cringe about what's she really going to say? What was it really like? It must have been terrible. And she's always so sort of nice uh, about how it, how it was. Uh, her, name is, um, her name is Danielle Gray, and she works in the White House now. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I, I thanked Dan, I've thanked Danielle several times because I, I really enjoyed my interactions with the students. I see a number of my students from property this section this year here. I see Jeff Skopek from a few years ago. Um, and thank you all. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, again, all of my colleagues on the faculty. I can't name you individually because I'll, I will, of course, leave someone out, but it's been, it's, it's made a, an incredible difference to me that uh, many of you have been close friends, many of you have been people, we just chat in the hallways, but it's really made an immense difference to me that I felt as though all of you wanted me to succeed and acts both great and small uh, that, you know, you all didn't always know made a great difference, really did make a great difference in, um, in my own life. Um, I'd like to thank the Beale family. As uh, Martha said, I learned that Lawrence Beale was a Philadelphia lawyer. It was almost exactly the same age as the lawyers, two of the lawyers I wrote about in my book. And, and, and I wrote about lawyers who are really at the margins of society, kind of struggling to figure out what it means to be a lawyer when African Americans are still not yet full citizens. And the people who were among the most admirable uh, in my book are often people who are kind of off stage. There are all these, these white lawyers who, um, in an era in which even in Philadelphia it wasn't, um, wasn't common to treat your black colleagues with basic humanity and respect, nonetheless did and made a huge difference in the lives of the, some of the lawyers who write about in my book, it made a huge difference, therefore, in a lar larger society. And in learning that my chair is named after one of these lawyers of exactly that generation um, is something that makes me proud. Um, I'm sorry, and I see Dan Epps over there, another of my former property students. I want to give a shout out to Dan. Um, thank you. So, so let me talk today, and you know, those of you who know me, Martha says, is, you know, I'm kind of meticulous. I got a long lecture here. It goes on and on. But Lonnie Guineer told me earlier, you know, Ken, you're going to get to a certain point and you should stop. So <laughs> I'm going to start and I'm going to get to a certain point and probably stop uh, understanding that there's a whole lot more paper under here, but uh, we only have limited time. So let me start. Um, but let me start actually um, 
two places, actually. Um, let me start by, um, before I get going with a story, actually, um, giving the story a little bit of context. I, um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the sit-in movement and about history. And, you know, I haven't really talked so much about uh, kind of what got me into history, you know, many of my colleagues uh, on the faculty, uh, but also uh, my, uh, my wife, Lisa Jones, who's here. Um, and I think I should really start this story that I'm going to tell today with her. I mean, she was interested in history when I didn't really know what history was. I, I knew what differential equations were, and I knew uh, how to model an electrical circuit, but I didn't really know much about history. But, um, but you know, we've been in this uh, very long journey, about 24 years now. Um, and I think whenever I start a story about history, I really should begin with her. Uh, so thank you. Second place to start is at the beginning of my story. And the story I'm going to tell today was, begins on February 1st in 1960, when four black students at North Carolina a t State University took their seats at a downtown a local Woolworths lunch counter and set off a controversy that eventually drew, drew in members of the United States Supreme Court, members of Congress and the Attorney General of the United States as they struggled to come to terms with the actions of these students. This was the birth of the sit-in movement. As young people began to sit in that year and as the movement spread throughout the South, it quickly grew into a social movement and in doing so it became a struggle over law. Local authorities sometimes arrested the protesters and charged them with trespass. And their lawyers claimed that they were protected from prosecution by the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses of the 14th Amendment. That argument seemed to place the sit-in protesters on a collision course with the state action doctrine, which was generally taken to mean that the effort to define and apply constitutional rights need not even begin unless the complaining party first demonstrates some government entity was responsible for the violation of her rights. The sit-in seemed to involve only private discriminatory action taken by business owners who chose to segregate. Not any race prejudice could be attributed to the state simply for enforcing its trespass laws. The state action doctrine, it was believed, could be traced back to the Supreme Court's 1883 decision in the civil rights cases, which to this day is generally regarded by both scholars and Supreme Court justices as a clear and unambiguous statement of the principle. Now, of course, with the passage of time, the sit-in protesters, who were lawbreakers in 1960, they were lawbreakers, that's how everyone regarded them, because everybody thought that they were not, they were not protected by the state action doctrine. With the passage of time, of course, we've come to think a little bit differently about the sit-in protesters. With the passage of time, in fact, a half century after the sit-ins, the sit-ins to us, the sit-in protesters to us seem like powerful exemplars of a long-standing tradition of breaking unjust laws. With their historic acts raising a classic problem of a conflict between law and morality. For historians, in addition, in particular, writing in a more recent tradition of the social history of law, the sitting cases would seem to provide powerful evidence of the ability of people with little formal power in the legal system to change established law. The success of the sit-in protesters in altering settled law and eventually contributing to the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 would seem to be clear evidence of the effectiveness of civil disobedience in challenging a legal system that clearly marked off the sit-ins as illegal. So sit-in protesters were lawbreakers then, or at least this is how we remember them. But to imagine that the sit-in protesters were lawbreakers as outsiders seeking a change in established law is to imagine the actual content of the law that applied to the sit-ins is fixed and knowable. But surely neither lawyers nor historians should be comfortable asserting such a position for what both legal and historical analysis share is a commitment to telling stories about the past. Lawyers construct precedents 
and historians construct narratives. But the path that seems to cohere in the hands of both lawyers and historians, of course, is far less coherent than the stories we construct from it. Even though the professional commitments of lawyers and historians require us to continue that process of reconstruction, problematic though it may be. The sit-ins and other developments during the civil rights era seem to present a fixed target for lawyers and legal theorists back in the 60s, as they do today, who are thinking about how law might be a powerful engine for the emerging civil rights movement. So for observers then and now, the poignant image of students being willing to go to jail for their, benefit, for their beliefs provided an equally tempting set of images that caused many to downplay the question of whether the students were, in fact, breaking the law. By the time, the sit by the time of the sit-in protesters, of course, many legal theorists were criticizing the state action doctrine as incoherent and recommending that courts should jettison it as a relic of the past. But just about everybody assumed that one could find the state action doctrine itself at some origin point in the past and the sit-in protesters' actions were not in accordance with the doctrine's original meaning. They were lawbreakers, people thought, then and now. But what I'd like to do today is to show how deeply problematic is the consensus story that's emerged 50 years after the sit-ins, a story shared by lawyers, historians, and Supreme Court justices. That story depends on two propositions that today I'd like to show our doubtful veracity. That the state action doctrine, the doctrine that defined the sit-in protesters actions as illegal, has some fixed origin point that one can trace to the 1883 decision in the civil rights cases, which is generally regarded as the source of the state action doctrine. Or that perhaps we can trace the state action doctrine to the text of the 14th Amendment and that the sit-in protests were in clear violation of that doctrine. What I'd like to do is go back to the imagined origin point of the story of law that circulated around the sit-ins. The text of the majority opinion of the, civil, of the Supreme Court in the civil rights cases written by Just, Justice Joseph Bradley. What I'd like to show today is that that 1883 opinion emerged from 20 years of struggle and argument that preceded it, a context in which blacks seeking freedom and whites sensing their world slipping apart, coming, coming apart, argued intensely over what was and should be the substantive content of the law applicable to black freedom. Those arguments and the resolution in Bradley's opinion in the civil rights cases had little to do with modern state action doctrine, I'll argue today. And second, at least if I have time, <laughs> what I might do is talk just a little bit about the state law applicable to the sit-in protesters, because surely if the state action doctrine didn't provi provide, if, if the state action doctrine um, it may or may not be a source of uh, resolution for the cases. Surely the sit-in protesters were breaking state law. But in fact, I contend it's not even clear whether they were breaking state trespass law. Now, where do we start? There's wide agreement that we begin the, star the story that, begin that ends with the sit-ins with Bradley's 1883 opinion in the civil rights cases, if not with the text of the 14th Amendment itself. So let me start with the text. The text seems pretty clear. It says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. Even legal historians reading this language have endorsed the proposition that the state action doctrine emerges from a straightforward reading of the text of the 14th Amendment. From this proposition, the result in the civil rights cases would seem to follow as a matter of course. What the Supreme Court decided in the civil rights cases was that the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which required the operators of public accommodations to admit patrons without regard to race, was unconstitutional. 
Congress could not act such a statute under its 14th Amendment power, the argument goes, because the amendment only reaches the actions of state actors and the 1875 Act applied to private business owners rather than public officials. <coughs> Lawyers, judges, and historians have parsed the words of the civil rights cases looking for the origins of the state action doctrine, and they've found it. But to do this, I would argue, is to get the story exactly backwards and to read the past through the 20th and now 21st century eyes. So rather than assuming an endpoint, modern state action, and looking for its origins, what I'd like to do today is sketch out just a little bit of the story, a story that begins in the closing years of the Civil War, and read that story forward to 1883 to give some sense of what was exactly at stake in the contending opinions in the civil rights cases. Indeed, even without reviewing that history, what one discovers if one just sort of reads the text of the civil rights cases, it's long. You, know, you have to put in a little effort, but you know, if you put in the effort and you read what they say, if you read it without the assumption that you're gonna find state action, what is striking is how little the justices paid any attention to the text of the 14th Amendment and how little they seem to be arguing that there is some kind of a wall of separation between the Constitution and private action. What Justice Bradley and the dissenting Justice John Marshall Harlan argued about, what they spent most of their energy grappling with, what they wrote about for pages and pages, was not state action, but something that seemed far more gripping and important to them, federalism. The question that Bradley and Harlan spent most of their time arguing about was this. Was discrimination in public accommodations part of the citizenship rights that had been brought under federal protection by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, or was it left under the control of the states? Bradley's majority opinion spent most of its space arguing that if Congress could enact a public accommodations law, it would allow that body to create a, quote, code of municipal law regulating private rights a phrase that Bradley repeated twice, and quote, make Congress take the place of state legislatures and supersede them. Justice Harlan's dissenting opinion devoted most of its time to refuting that exact proposition, arguing that the amendments, the Civil War amendments, did confer broad authority upon Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act, the first federal public accommodations law, but that such authority would not empower the federal government to, according to Justice Harlan, quote, create a municipal code for all the states covering every matter affecting the life, liberty, and property of the citizens of the several cases, of the several states. So what they argued about for pages and pages in that sort of 19th century verbose style was federalism. Now, Bradley, of course, did write the words that Sort of everyone sort of reads and kind of thinks that he's talking about state action. He wrote, for instance, that, quote, civil rights, such as are guaranteed by the Constitution against state aggression, cannot be impaired by the wrongful actions of individuals, close quote. But however, as I'll explain below, he was decidedly not saying that the actions of private individuals are immune from constitutional scrutiny. Indeed, less than a decade before, Bradley had ruled that the Civil War amendments to the Constitution did empower Congress to reach private action. What was really at work in the arguments between Harlan and Bradley in the civil rights cases was an attempt to close down a long-running debate that stretched back to the Civil War about the scope of federal versus state authority. And in that debate, Bradley himself had taken a somewhat different position initially from the one he would take in 1883. But by that time, many things had happened to change his mind. So the story that ends, although I'll say at the end it doesn't really end, but the story that we might imagine ends in the civil rights cases begins two decades earlier in the midst of the Civil War. At that time, African Americans began to assail the basic constitutional understandings under which the Union was prosecuting the war. Acts, of course, that would reverberate a century later 
when four black students took their seats at the Woolworths lunch counter. But in 1863 and in 1864, as emancipation became a more explicit war aim for the Union effort, black Americans were insisting that implicit in the abolition of slavery was a grant of full civil and political rights to, to freed men and freed women. As Congress considered, considered the anti-slavery constitutional amendment, the 13th Amendment, in 1864, black delegates from all across the country gathered in Syracuse, New York where they formed a national organization called the Equal Rights League. Their lawyers, like Boston's John Rock and Ohio's John Mercer Langston, took the lead in def defining the agenda for the convention and outmaneuvered other black delegates who were tainted by their association with immigrationism, the idea that black Americans should immigrate to another country like Haiti, where they could have full civil and political rights. Rock and Langston insisted on broad-based equality within the national borders as a right that could not be denied once freedom took hold. Langston was elected president of the Equal Rights League, and the following year he would tell a black convention in Indiana that, quote, the Negro demands absolute legal equality. He claims the right to bring suit in any and all courts of the country to be a witness of competent character, to make contracts under seal or otherwise, to acquire, hold, and transmit property to be liable to none other than the common and usual punishment for offenses committed by him. Other black Americans were pushing even further and were claiming rights to equal access to schools, streetcars, transportation, and public accommodations. Now these were radical claims in 1864 and 1865, as Langston, Rock, and others surely knew, not only because they went beyond what most whites were prepared to grant, but because they involved matters that were almost wholly governed by state law. Basic rights to governing contract property and the ability to bring suits in local courts and similar matters were governed by the states. Even qualifications for voting were generally subject to state law to define. To claim equal rights across the board went far beyond mainstream conceptions of citizenship, and there seemed to be little chance of obtaining it under state law. In fact, in 1865 and 1866, white voters in three northern states, when given the chance to confer the franchise upon African Americans, rejected it. In the South, the prospect for equality was enforced only by displacing local institutions with national power. So when black Americans began to argue for equal citizenship rights in the closing years of the Civil War, they inevitably began to put pressure on pre-war ideas of federalism and of state jurisdiction over basic constitutional rights. Now in the debate about federalism that broke out in the closing years of the war, the counterparts to figures like Langston and Rock were three fugitive slaves who in the early months of the Civil War had fled to Fortress Monroe, Virginia, which was then under the command of a Union general named Benjamin Butler. As much as that the acts of their better known lawyer counterparts, these three individuals would place the question of equality and of federalism before the nation at large. General Butler was reluctant to return the fugitives to bondage, but he was also cognizant that it was Union policy not to interfere with slavery outside of the, of the confines of Union lines. So he labeled the, free, the three fugitives contrabands of war, a term that would come to apply to the thousands that would flee to Union lines during the war, as Butler's decision became federal policy. But his decision not to return the fugitives to slavery threatened to overturn the constitutional assumptions under which the Union was conducting the war. In fact, less than Two months earlier, Abraham Lincoln had endorsed the original 13th Amendment, passed by Congress but never ratified, which would prevent the national government from interfering with slavery in states where it presently existed. Lincoln and other Republicans believed that slavery to be a domestic or municipal institution with which Congress had no power to interfere where it was protected by state law. Republicans lodged their power to emancipate the fugitives and validated Butler's contraband policy under the laws of war, while carefully limiting Congress's power to emancipate in order to preserve pre-war ideas of federalism. 
Yet everywhere those ideas came under pressure. Slowly pushed by fugitives and by Northern African Americans, Americans began to confront the question of the relationship between emancipation and equal citizenship rights. In fact, as Congress sent the second, or the second 13th Amendment to the states, this was the anti-slavery 13th Amendment known to us, the question that black and white Americans began to confront was precisely the one that Bradley and Harlan would argue about two decades later. What did the Emancipation Amendment do to pre-war ideas of federalism, which it lodged basic citizenship rights, for the most part, with the states? John Rock himself would make the then bold step in that effort with the assistance of abolitionist senator and later sponsor of the 1875 Civil Rights Act, Charles Sumner. On the day that the 13th Amendment was, was sent to the states, Sumner and Rock secured Rock's admission to the bar of the Supreme Court. He was the first black lawyer to be admitted to the Supreme Court's bar as an explicit repudiation of Chief Justice Taney's ruling in Dred Scott that black Americans could not be citizens. Right, on the same day that the 13th Amendment is sent to the states. In fact, that choice was no accident for both men believed that Rock's admission as a lawyer to the Supreme Court bar was a tacit concession that black Americans were entitled to the same political and civil rights as whites nationally. Sumner believed that, quote, the admission of a colored lawyer to the bar of the Supreme Court would make it difficult for any colored lawyer, excuse me, for any restriction on account of color to be maintained anywhere. Streetcars would be open afterwards, he continued, sketching out what he believed to be the radical implications of that simple act of admitting a black man to the bar of the Supreme Court on the day that the 13th Amendment was ratified. In Philadelphia, the local chapter of the Equal Rights League and other African American groups viewed the 13th Amendment as a justification for a renewal of their campaign for equal access to streetcars. The day the amendment was approved in Congress, local streetcar companies responded to that campaign by announcing the result of a poll where whites overwhelmingly voted uh, to exclude African Americans from streetcars. But the move movement quickly secured a decision from a local court that excluding African Americans from streetcars was an actionable offense. In reversing what was taken to be settled law in Pennsylvania, the local judge stated that, quote, the logic of the past four years has in many respects cleared our vision and our judgment that it's changed state law in Pennsylvania. Two years later, in a better known decision, another local court will reject the claim that the 13th Amendment required desegregation of streetcars in the famous decision that would eventually find its way into the text of the Supreme Court's opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson. Opponents of emancipation shared many of these same views of the stakes behind, the, uh, behind emancipation. As the 13th Amendment was debated in Congress, Democrats reserved their strongest objection, well, their strongest objection other than appeals to race prejudice, to, the, to emancipation for the claim that the amendment was a radical revision of existing ideas of limited national power that had been written into the nation's founding documents. They also argued that the amendment would confer both citizenship and the wide range of rights, including suffrage on the freed slaves, right? So they argued that the amendment, by emancipating the slaves, we are going to destroy American federalism. This was the core democratic argument. Now, of course, it's strategic language, right? They're trying to defeat the, the amendment, but you know, every piece of strategic language must ground itself in some version of plausible reality. And these were the stakes. This was the form of the debate that Americans engaged in uh, with emancipation. Now, of course, none of what I've said so far should be taken as an attempt to take in a position on the long-running argument about exactly which constitutional rights were federalized with the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. I don't take a position on that debate. But what I like, what I have done, I think, is sketch just the terms under which Americans were debating emancipation. What did they think was on the table? And what it was noteworthy about these debates is that the participants understood themselves to be debating federalism, as did Bradley and Harlan nearly 20 years later. Now, Joseph Bradley would eventually 
play a key role in the resolution of the debate I've just outlined, the resolution of the debate about whether and to what extent the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments nationalized pre-war notions of citizenship. And the reason he did this was because he joined the Supreme Court in 1870, and he's immediately assigned to the Fifth Circuit, which stretches from Florida to Texas. And with months of, within months of taking a seat on the court, the former New Jersey lawyer took up his circuit duties. You know, those days, Supreme Court justices had to travel circuit, something that I'm sure Elena Kagan is very glad today she doesn't have to do. In those days, you had to travel circuit. You had to go. You had to hear cases all over the country. So Bradley's jurisdiction is the American South, and he's from New Jersey. And with, in months of taking a seat on his court, the former New Jersey lawyer took up his circuit writing duties and began to travel through a region he barely knew. What Bradley saw there, what anyone would see there, was violence prompted by African Americans asserting a full range of rights that they claimed in the later stages of the war. In Texas, Bradley heard cases in a place where no federal judge sat since before the war and where federal officials reported church bombings and murders as commonplace experiences for former slaves without adequate protection under state law. In South Carolina later that year, black and white Republicans fell prey to overwhelming Ku Klux Klan violence and terrorism that made any question of state prosecution of the perpetrators moot and threatened to bury the federal court under an avalanche of federal cases. Federal prosecutors unsuccessfully argued that the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 enacted to rein in the spiraling Klan violence would cover acts that seemed like ordinary state crimes. Right, so this is the debate as Bradley travels through the South. Could you indict Ku Klux Klan members under the Enforcement Acts for acts that seemed like ordinary state crimes? And when Bradley reached New Orleans, he was faced with the first major federal decision about the scope of the Civil War amendments in the slaughterhouse cases, where oddly enough, a group of Democrats used the 14th Amendment to ask for an injunction against a Republican-backed Louisiana law that regulated butchers. And there he gave an expansive interpretation of the amendment's reach without reaching the difficult issues of federalism presented by the Ku Klux Klan cases. Now, when Bradley finally reached those issues, he would decide them using the distinction between state and national citizenship, which did not track the later division between public and private action. The occasion was his court ruling in the aftermath of the Colfax Massacre. The bloodiest single act of carnage in all of Reconstruction, as Eric Foner has called it. Louisiana. Politically motivated racial violence mostly directed at black Republicans that never really ceased in Louisiana, with repeated street battles and massacres extending into the 1870s. In the aftermath of a disputed 1872 election that resulted in the, the in the seating of two rival state governments, governments and uncertain governance throughout the state, a white mob murdered more than 100 black men at a local courthouse in Grant Parish where Republican officials had gathered to take control of the local government. In fact, those Republican officials included none other than William Ward, himself a former contraband who had fled slavery in 1864 by fleeing to Fortress Monroe before making his way to Louisiana. At the subsequent trial in, in New Orleans, Federal Circuit Judge and future Supreme Court Justice William Woods brushed aside constitutional objections to indictments of private actors under the 1870, 18, the 1870 Enforcement Act, ruling that, quote, denying the equal protection of the laws includes the omission to protect as well the, as the omission to pass laws for protection, meaning we can indict the defendants under federal law where they're not adequately protected under state law. In fact, the passage that I've just quoted was a direct quotation from Justice Bradley himself, who had written a letter several years earlier to Woods asserting that the 14th Amendment empowered Congress to directly reach the actions of private actors, at least when state laws protect, fail to protect against those actions. After the first trial ended inconclusively for most of the defendants, Bradley joined Woods 
in presiding over a second trial that resulted in three convictions, although Bradley left early to continue his circuit duties. After returning to New Orleans, an expected crowd awaited in and outside the courtroom as Justice Bradley rendered an opinion assessing a legal challenge to the result of the trial. In his Colfax Massacre opinion, Joseph Bradley would finally write a formal legal opinion assessing the nationalizing questions that had been raised by Langston Rock and others in the closing days of the Civil War. Bradley framed the issues presented by the Louisiana prosecution as a question of national versus state power. Quote, the main ground of the ejection is that the act is municipal in character. Right, the same phrase he would use in the civil rights cases. Municipal in character, operating directly on the conduct of individuals, taking the place of ordinary state legislation. That is, the question of whether, was whether or not the Enforcement Act extended to matters normally consigned to state citizenship. For an answer, he first turned to the 13th Amendment, which he concluded had not only eradicated slavery, right? What does the 13th Amendment do? This is the first question Bradley answers. The 13th Amendment, quote, required that the slaves should be made a citizen and placed on an entire equality before the law with the white citizen. That is, under the 13th Amendment power, Bradley ruled, Congress could do whatever was necessary to make former slaves equal citizens as it had done in enacting the Civil Rights Act of 1866. For example, if a black patron, well, this is an interesting example, Bradley says, if a black patron, quote, desired to lease and cultivate a farm in a neighborhood or community proposed, composed principally of whites, and a combination should be formed to expel him and prevent him from accomplishment of his purpose on account of his race, Congress could directly reach the actions of these individual private actors under the 13th Amendment, given that they had interfered with the right to property which was recognized under the Civil Rights Act of 1866. So the first thing he ruled, of course, is that the 13th Amendment protects against private action directly. He struggled more with the 15th Amendment as a justification for the prosecution, but he similarly concluded that Congress could protect voting rights, quote, not only against the unfriendly operation of state laws, but against outrage, violence, and combinations on the part of individuals, irrespective of state laws, meaning that Congress can directly reach individual actions under its 15th Amendment power. With regard to the nebulous privileges and immunities protected under the 14th Amendment, Bradley, however, had changed his mind. In the letter that Woods had quoted, Judge Woods had quoted in rejecting constitutional objections to the first trial, Bradley had concluded that the 14th Amendment could reach the actions of private actors when state governments were unwilling and unable to protect basic rights. Now he changed his mind, concluding that under the 14th Amendment, Congress could only protect privileges and immunities against, quote, the acts of state governments themselves. But he arrived at that conclusion using a complicated argument about what were the privileges of citizens that existed before the Constitution was adopted and which privileges were committed solely to state governments for their protection. Right? He arrived at that conclusion based on a, a reading of federalism. What had Bradley decided? First, he had partly recognized the expansive citizenship claims that black Americans had pressed upon their white counterparts as emancipation loomed in the 1860s. The 13th Amendment itself conferred a broad range of citizenship rights, according to Bradley. For instance, the right, all the rights protected by the 1866 Civil Rights Act and empowered Congress to secure them against interference because of race by even non-state individual actors. The 15th Amendment had done much the same with regard to voting rights. But Bradley had also helped sound the death knell to Reconstruction, as he surely knew. Bradley ruled that the indictment should be dismissed. Some of them he ruled were not word worded properly. Others he ruled that were mat involved matters directly um, that state law needed to regulate rather than the federal. Of course, the defendants could be re-indicted right, if you know, the indictments were worded properly, but that was unlikely in an atmosphere of continued violence. With the wind taken out of its sails, the prosecution lost its momentum, and the experiment in black citizenship began to die in Louisiana, as it had throughout the former slave states. Woods disagreed with Bradley's opinion, but it stood as the ruling of the circuit court. 
and the Supreme Court would eventually affirm that ruling in the case now known as the United States versus Kurukshank. What then should one make of Bradley's subsequent opinion for the court holding the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconstitutional, an opinion that 80 years later would supposedly make the sit-in protesters' actions illegal? His majority opinion in the civil rights cases was not the first time he'd opined upon the, the act's constitutionality. In fact, some years earlier, in a letter to Woods, Bradley had pronounced it a very close question whether a public accommodations statute was constitutional, a federal public accommodation statute, saying that he'd have to think a little bit more about it. As he delivered the court's majority opinion in the civil rights cases, however, he was far more certain of his ground. He deployed the same framework of state versus national rights that he used in his Colfax opinion, a framework shared by Justice Harlan in dissent, but now he drew the circle around the scope of the 13th Amendment much more narrowly. He famously said, quote, it would be running the argument against slavery into the ground, close quote, to conclude that access to theaters, restaurants, and the like was necessary to emancipate former slaves and give them equal citizenship rights with whites. Bradley's 14th Amendment, was, 14th Amendment ruling was much easier given what he had said in the, in the Colfax case. Now what Bradley said about the 14th Amendment, that it only applied to the actions of individuals, later scholars took him to be saying about a much broader set of rights that were written into the nation's basic law by the Civil War amendments. And with that, the long-running debate about how much of the pre-war constitutional order had been revised by emancipation, the debate begun by African Americans during the latter stages of the Civil War came to a tentative resolution. Modern state action doctrine, the idea of a wall between constitutional rights and private action, was not in evidence in the civil rights case's opinion, written by Bradley and joined by seven other justices, including former Judge Woods, who is now sitting on the Supreme Court. That would have belied what Bradley and Woods had seen in the Reconstruction era South where they grappled with the problem of white citizens themselves acting to suppress the broad set of rights claimed by their black counterparts. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional, Bradley wrote, because it protected rights that were within the realm of state citizenship, citizenship rather than federal. Presumably left intact were, those, were the conclusions he reached in his Colfax opinion that private interference with voting rights came within the ambit of the 15th Amendment and that private actors who denied their fellow citizens any of the rights encompassed in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the right to property, for instance, could be brought within the prohibitions contained in the 13th Amendment. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional, he believed, because the rights it protected did not come within either of these categories. The idea of state action doctrine, the constitutional division between private right and state actors, is a later development. The story of that development is a tale of invented history a comforting history in which the question presented by the state action controversies of the 20th century, those over racially restrictive covenants, company towns, white primaries, and of course the sit-ins had already been decided. That story has yet to be completely told. Although one has to say the civil rights cases were a tentative resolution to the problem of black citizenship because in truth, all that Bradley had done was to pick one reading among the many that blacks and whites had debated ever since the first three contrabands arrived at Fortress Monroe in 1861. There was leakiness in the framework that Bradley had erected to wall off the constitutional implications of emancipation and black citizenship, and through those leaks would pour the arguments of a variety of rights claimants. The idea that state action erected a wall between the Civil War amendments and private actions, action might have seemed like one implication of some of the language of his opinion, but pushed by African Americans who claims, whose claims to citizenship ranged from public accommodations to voting, Bradley had initially conceded the Civil War amendments might protect a wider range of rights from interference by private actors, at least when states did not protect them. He tried to pull back from that opinion in his Colfax opinion and pull back even more in the civil rights cases but even his, his narrower, later framework left room for arguments about the, quote, badges and incidents of slavery that could be directly protected by the 13th Amendment against private action, an argument that continues to this day. 
Now, of course, the second half of my talk is about state law, but we've been here for uh, 35 minutes. I'm going to obey Lonnie's instruction <laughs> and try to conclude. But we can do this in the Q&A. But one of the things I do in the second half of my paper, actually drawing on uh, work by, by Joe Singer, of course, is, is to show how it's not even clear that the sit-in protesters were in violation of state law. Almost no, actually, I, let me see. I think no southern state actually has a statute that requires segregation in businesses open to the public. They have railroad segregation statutes, they have lots of other statutes, but they don't have these kinds of segregation statutes. And the question is whether or not the sit-in protesters were in violation of some state law. That question winds up being a common law question, and the common law applicable to the sit-ins turns out to be a complete mess. But ah, we don't have time to do that today. <laughs> what we do have time to do is to draw a few conclusions. So perhaps the story of the sit-ins has a more difficult set of questions to teach us about how we tell stories. At least, if we put aside our assumption that the sit-in protesters were violating the law. Perhaps the story of the sit-ins has, has a story to tell us about how we write history how we remember the past, and how we do law. History, of course, is a story that we create to organize the messiness of social reality and an artificial construct imposed upon the past. Legal precedents are basically the same thing, right? And our story about the state action doctrine as some kind of fixed doctrine that we can trace back to the civil rights cases is belied by that much messier reality. Now, of course, this is something, what I've just said, is something we teach to our first-year students all the time. That when one looks for law, what one finds are competing claims, precisely because of the messiness of the materials out of which we, correct, we construct law. And the civil rights cases are just another part of that messiness. Perhaps, then, the, the lesson to be taken from the sit-in cases is that rather than a conflict between law and morality, a tale of young people choosing to violate the law to change it, perhaps the lesson we should really take from the, from the sit-in cases should be that something else is at work. Something that we, as teachers, students, and observers of law, should recognize quite easily. The messiness of law, the multiple answers that one can draw upon the, from the past, and the things that we teach and write about every day. Thanks. Um, sure. Uh, I, I'm told we have time for Q&A, but I do see sort of wine and things like that in the background. So whenever Martha tells me it's, it's time, it will be time. But sure, Q&A. Sure. So you did a wonderful, powerful job showing how, rather than state action, the federalism debate really was dominant. But I wondered about the action part, not just state and federal, and the inaction, the inaction of the state to protect rights, and how that is also part of the state. Yeah, and Ian, you know, what I've done is just, it's, it's very sketchy. Um, and, and I'm trying to be suggestive, and, and I'm not going to have time to really sort of do this um, as, 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 a, as a proper, you know, as a proper project in the, in the time I have today. Um, but clearly what's going on is, is a real question about state inaction. Um, what Bradley really sees all over the South is that basic constitutional rights, basic citizenship rights are not going to be protected by the, the state governments. Um, that's the question. It, it, it arises just kind of early on. The, um, the Ku Klux Klan cases that I, that I mentioned, these are famous cases. They're sort of discussed all over the country. And you know, essentially, you know, the, um, there are hundreds of federal prosecutions in South Carolina. It overwhelms the federal, federal court system. There's debate in Congress about it. Everybody understands that you just, the states are simply not acting to protect um, 
Friedman's basic citizenship rights. So what Bradley's really seeing is that, in fact, um, the real question is state inaction. That what do we do when basic rights to contract property, personal security, are simply not going to be protected under state law? And initially he says, okay, when that happens, it's, you know, this is exactly why we passed the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment. Um, he, he's essentially saying that, you know, as a direct outgrowth of emancipation, that freedmen actually have these rights. He actually says this very explicitly in his Colfax Massacre opinion. As a direct outgrowth of emancipation, freedmen actually have the right to engage in contract, to hold property. He's a little fuzzier about voting, although he's got language. He, he says the franchise, and you know, we lawyers can sort of debate what he means when he uses the word the franchise, but he's saying exactly that, you know, that you know, one of the implications of emancipation was that, um, that African Americans have to have basic citizenship rights. And, there, and, and, and what he sees when he goes through the South is that you know, there's state inaction. These are simply not being protected under state law. Other, sure, Tamika. Yes, Ken, I really enjoyed your lecture. Thanks so much for that. I have a question that takes us to the 1960s, the way from the 1860s. Yes. And it's a question not about the Supreme Court and the protesters, but about the, the lawyers. And in particular, I'm so interested to know what account you would give of Thurgood Marshall's reaction to the, the senators, the protesters, initially. Um, he is one of the main proponents of the idea that the senators are lawbreakers, right? And he could be talking at two different levels. So he could simply be talking about them breaking the trespass laws. But the, but the idea of them breaking the trespass laws connects back to the state action issue. Um, so, so the question is, are, are you making a claim about his understanding of the doctrine? Are, are you saying that it's only now looking back that you're offering this more textured understanding of, of the doctrine? Are you saying that it was um, within his reach at the time? What, what, how would you explain this? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give a tentative answer to the question, given that we have a Thurgood Marshall biographer in the audience. Um, but, um, you know, I, my understanding of, lots of people have exactly the same reaction. So Harry Truman, right, his civil rights credentials are quite substantial. He's the first president to come out in favor of civil rights and risks a lot to do this. Um, Harry Truman calls the sit-ins a communist conspiracy. Uh, you know, lots of people struggle with the idea that the sit-in protesters are breaking the law, just as black. You know, black initially sort of, you know, he's a little sympathetic to what the Supreme Court does. The Supreme Court sort of dances around the question of whether or not sit-ins are breaking the law. They, uh, they figure out a way of, of invalidating the trespass prosecutions of the sit-in protesters. Um, they kind of dance around it. And then finally, they, they pull back from it. And black is one of the people who wants to pull completely back from it. And Black thinks that the sit-in protesters are clearly in violation of state law. And he, thinks, and, the, and, he, and he thinks that they're clearly not protected by the state act. You know, the whatever kind of wiggle room there is in state action, they're not, they're not in it. Um, so I think the part of the story I'm telling is that at some point in the 20th century, people come to believe that the state action doctrine really does exist. And at some point, they construct this story that you can just sort of read it out of the civil rights cases and sort of read it forward. And that story is false, actually. That, you know, at some point it does come to be widely believed that this is true. You know, that's kind of beyond the scope of, of what I'm doing today. But Thurgood Marshall is sort of drawn in by that story. You know, he doesn't understand that the story is false. Second thing I'd say is, uh, let me say three things. Second thing I'd say is that, um, is that it's in the interest of the lawyers to present state law, present the sit-in protesters as explicitly violating state law. Because the civil rights lawyers want to get to the constitutional issues. So you don't want to say that the sit-in protesters are just not in violation of Maryland law. What you want to say is that they're protected by the 14th Amendment because you want to make the constitutional claim. But to make the constitutional claim, you have to assume that they're not protected by state law. 
Um, and just to kind of, okay, third thing, just to kind of just do, do it this really brief, because I, I said this at the Supreme Court last fall. Like the last of the sit-in cases, almost the last of the sit-in cases to get the Supreme Court is this case called Bell versus Maryland. It's from Maryland. Um, and it's the case that convinces Hugo Black that no, 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 these guys are, these the sit-in protesters are in, you know, they're violating settled property rights. They're violating trespass law. It's actually not clear. Maryland is the last place that you should think the sit-in protesters are violating state trespass law because at the time that the Maryland sit-in case is coming to the Supreme Court, Maryland's changing its law. Uh, it repeals all of the state, stat state segregation statutes. Baltimore actually passes a civil rights law, right, uh, prohibiting segregation in businesses open to the public in Baltimore. The Maryland state legislature passes a state civil rights law prohibiting segregation in businesses open to the public. They, they exempt a bunch of parts of Maryland from the law. They exempt the Eastern Shore from the law. It's kind of complicated. But, you know, Black thinks that the sit-in protesters are in violation of Maryland law. At the very moment that Maryland is changing its laws to create a right of access to public accommodations. So the case that everybody thinks presents this thing starkly, the conflict between law and morality, the question of whether we should protect lawbreakers, is, is essentially the last case in which you should think, think this way about it. So, so what I'm really arguing, actually, is that the substantive, con the substantive content of law is changing in the early 1960s. It is changing. It's not quite changing in Alabama. It's not quite changing in Mississippi. But this is kind of what the citizens are really about. It's about changing the substantive content of law in a context where it's actually not clear that the sit-in protesters are actually in violation of state law. Now, this is different than the question of you know, every Alabama court is going to hold that they're trespassers, right? Almost every Maryland court will hold that they're trespassers. But there's a decent argu argument that you're simply not in violation of state law. But it's in everybody's interest to sort of think that that question is clear. And it's everybody's interest to sort of think that the state action question is clear in the sense that there's some origin point where, it's, where you know, we, you can find it. And we're kind of debating whether or not we should do away with it. That's a long answer, but my students are, they're, they're used to that, but, <laughs> Chris. So can I ask you sort of to pick up on where you left us and say more about why we make the state action? I mean, I understand that some people's interest in the 1960s think, here's the, here's the doctrine that goes back, but we're in the messy way of the world and in the law. Mm -hmm. There were things that made it plausible, a plausible story. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear you say more about that. Because it, you know, to me, on one hand, one could think of the rise of the market, right, mm -hmm. in some ways, um, sanctifying private activity. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you could think of the New Deal as maybe scaring people mm -hmm. about the future of the public. So, so it seems like there are all these possibilities that could be making this the, the rubric. And I'd love to hear you. Yeah, and I, I'm going to have to kind of, you know, this I don't actually have an answer to, but you, you've supplied a bunch of the possible answers, right? Um, I'm doing this class on the history of economic regulation, and the you know, question we asked sort of last week was, you know, and sorry, okay, I go into too much detail, but, you know, Munn versus Illinois, you know, the effect with the public interest, you know, the Supreme Court sort of says, okay, there's kind of, there's kind of private interest and then there's public regulation, and I asked the students, well, kind of why did they set it up that way? It's not clear that they should set it up that way. And in light of a lot of things that's ha that have happened up until that point, it's not clear that you set it up that way. So by the late 19th century, lots of people are sort of setting up, they're framing many, many questions about uh, private interest and public regulation. They're framing lots of questions that way. And the civil rights cases, it's 1883, we're almost to the point where many, many courts begin to frame questions that way. But we're not quite there. So one story about state action is that you, know, you can find it by 1900. Um, Charles Black has a famous Harvard Law Review forward where he basically sort of tries to do the history of state action. And he thinks that if you read the cases, the 1900 cases, you can find courts that are staying, saying state action. 
I haven't read those cases, so you know, I, gotta, you know, the, I, I don't know whether that story is true. You know, another story is the New Deal story, right? Because one of the things that Black sort of says in his forward is that you know, all the cases are kind of murky. We don't exactly know where it comes from, although even Black thinks that you can find it in the civil rights cases. The second story is the one you said, which is even more suggestive that it's only maybe in the New Deal era. So when we teach Marsh versus Alabama, for my students who are in the audience, when we teach Marsh versus Alabama, maybe what Marsh versus Alabama is really about is asserting that there is this conflict in an era in which, you know, even as late as the, as the 1830s, we're not sure if, if we can coherently say that there's something that we can call state action. So the short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is, it's a really intriguing question, and here are certain possible answers. Okay, one more. Sure, Richard. My question is, it's a differently fit question, maybe a little bit related to Miko. And that is, um, your story may well be the more historically accurate story. Is it as good a story? Um, in other words, uh, civil obedience doesn't have the same ring to it, to me, as civil obedience. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the, the moral force in the example of the civil movement reaching forward was the fact you could say they were breaking the law. Uh, and they were willing to, they, they knew that, they were willing to do it in a civil fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wondered whether or not that aspect of the moral force of civilly disobeying the law mm -hmm. uh, might have been a little bit embedded in Tomiko's question about whether Thurgood Marshall, even if he had thought that, he, that, that, that there was just this moral force to the notion so maybe an accurate story, huh? Is it as good a story? <laughs> this is so interesting. Um, you know, is it as good a story? It's, okay, a couple things. That, that's, that's actually an interesting way to think about it. Now, I am, I'm, clearly cons I'm clearly on board with the idea that the students are acting against established authority. They understand that the authorities in Maryland and Virginia and Alabama are going to send them to jail. Uh, and they're choosing to do that, and there's, and there's a great moral force in the choosing to do that. Um, and, and that part of the story I don't really have a quibble with. So there is a kind of civil disobedience story sort of embedded in it, even if you believe what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, as lawyers, right, and as historians, these are the kinds of stories that we're naturally trained to take apart, right? Because the legal materials are actually malleable. And the legal materials applicable to the sit-ins in the 1960s are actually quite malleable. Um, I mean, it doesn't detract from the moral force of what the sit-in protesters were doing. But I would think in a room full of people like us, we should understand that those questions are complicated, contested and contextual, exactly the way that historians understand them. So there's no contest, but that, that was a great lecture. There is one more thing to do before we have drinks, and that is actually to have the chair. made a frame of the poster for the... Thank you. Oh, no. Okay.